This is the first 8.2 video, and we're going to look at estimating a population proportion. So essentially, it's how to create a confidence interval for a population proportion. Uh, I want to start with a, a simple example just to refresh on how a confidence interval works, and then we'll dive into the specifics of how to actually calculate it today. So Miss Barbero has recently watched Lord of the Rings movies, and she has decided that is the best movie trilogy ever made. She proclaimed this to her class, and one of her students sharply disagreed and said the Star Wars trilogy is better. This caught Miss Barbero off guard and made her wonder which movie trilogy is more popular among the high school students in her school district. To try and figure out the question to her, the answer to her question, she took a simple random sample of 100 students and asked them which movie trilogy is better, Lord of the Rings or Star Wars. From her sample, 52% said Lord of the Rings was better, which I agree, Lord of the Rings is the ultimate. But that's not, uh, that's not the point here. The point is she wants to know P, where P stands for the population proportion from her school district that think Lord of the Rings is better than Star Wars. Now, she doesn't know, and her best estimate, as long as the simple random sample is a trustworthy sample, her best estimate right now is 52%. So her sample proportion or point estimator, as we've learned before, is 0 0.52. And so what she'll do is she will use that to build an interval to try and capture the true unknown parameter. So her point estimate is 0.52 and she's gonna go up. Let's just say the margin of error was uh, 0.02 or 0.02 or 2%. So then she's gonna go up the margin of error to 54% and down to 50%. So this is what we've known so far. The point estimate plus or minus the margin of error gives us the actual interval. So if this was a 95% confidence interval, Ms. Barbera would be 95% confident that the true proportion of students at her school district who think Lord of the Rings is better is between 50% and 54%. Today's goal is how do you actually calculate these values? Right now, all you know is this is the margin of error, the distance here. And you also know, as you can see be below here, the formula is the statistic plus or minus the critical value, which is dependent on the level of confidence and the standard deviation of the statistic, which is dependent on the statistic as well as the sample size. So in order to teach you uh, the formula for a confidence interval, what I wanna do is I wanna assume that we actually do know the truth. Now, in reality, you're never gonna know the true population parameter, but to help you understand the concept it's more helpful if we do know. So let's just assume, let's just assume that we do know, and Ms. Barbaro doesn't, that the true proportion is 50%. So you can see her sample wasn't exactly right, but in the end, it captured, it captured the true population parameter. So before I hop into the formula for a confidence interval, Let's just think, because the formula comes from a sampling distribution, let's think about what would the sampling distribution look like if she took many samples of size 100 and um, distributed the proportion from each sample. Well, we should know that a sampling distribution, it's when you take all possible samples and you plot all the PN. So I'm gonna draw out here what the sampling distribution would start to look like. So this is what our sampling distribution would start to look like. Um, and remember, I've only taken one, two, three, four, five, six. I've only taken like 10-ish samples, but a sampling distribution would require me to take all possible samples from the population. So this is just the start of it. And we know if, if the true population proportion really is 50%, then it's gonna be centered at 50%. We know the mean of the sampling distribution is equal to the population parameter. Next, we'll ask ourselves, what would the shape of the distribution look like? This is where the large counts condition comes into play, which we've seen in the previous chapter. So large counts will make sure there's 10 successes and 10 failures. So if the population is equal to uh, 50%, then in a sample of 100, we're gonna get 50 successes, 50 failures, which means the shape of the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. Next, what would the spread be? We know the center, we know the shape, the spread, check the 10% condition. 10% condition means 
is our sample less than 10% of the whole population, which if, if we're looking at the whole school district, then a sample size of 100 is going to be less than 10% of the whole school district. So 100 is going to be less than 10% of the population, which means that the 10% condition is met. Now we can find the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of PHAT, where we know the population to be centered at 50%. Now we have all we need to know about the sampling distribution if the true proportion is 50%. Now remember, in reality, we would never know what the true portion is. But if we knew it was 50%, this is what we expect the sampling distribution to look like. It's centered at 50%. It's normal, which is really important because now we know that 95% of all sample proportions are within two standard deviations of the truth. We know that 68% of all P hats are within one standard deviation. And we know that three, that, uh, 99.7% of all P hats are within three standard deviations. That's a benefit of knowing that it's a normal distribution. And so when we are calculating a confidence interval, all of this plays into the formula where the critical value and the standard deviation of the statistic come from. This right here is essentially the standard deviation of the statistic. The only difference is we use the population parameter. In real life, we don't know the population parameter. We estimate it with the sample proportion. So here we would instead, since we don't know P, we would have to use 0.52 as our estimate of the population proportion. And so this is what our formula looks like. We have our point estimate plus or minus the margin of error, which is the critical value times the standard deviation of the statistic. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this scenario and actually plug in what we know and calculate, create the confidence interval for this scenario, assuming that we don't know the true population proportion. So let's talk through this information here. P hat is the sample proportion or the statistic, which her sample that she took was 52%. Next, we have the critical value, which depends on the level of confidence. So as I said before, the level of confidence tells us the critical value from a normal population. You know that 95% of all observations are within two standard deviations. Well, it's not technically two standard deviations. It's actually 1.96, but to make the rule better, they round up. So more on this in, uh, later in this video, but if it's 95%, it's actually 1.96 is the critical value. I'll show you how to find that later. And then the standard deviation of the statistic it's just the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So here the, we do the P hat times one minus P hat divided by the sample size, which was hundred. So this is actually called, this is actually called the standard error of P hat. And it's called the standard error because whenever we substitute a proportion, a sample proportion for a population proportion, it's, it's no longer called the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. It's called the standard error of P hat because we, in reality, we never know what the population proportion is. We have to use our sample to estimate it. So instead of 0.5, we're using 0.52 because the 0.5 in reality is unknown. And then it becomes called the standard error of the statistic in P hat in this case. So, so really all you're doing is finding these three values and then you have, your, you have your confidence interval. These two combined are called the margin of error. But a couple really important things about confidence intervals is it all depends on this sampling distribution. So we have to check the conditions here. Uh, we have to make sure that the sample was randomly selected. It has to be a trustworthy sample. So here's number one. That, that really is for P hat. Is our P hat trustworthy? Next condition, which you've seen already is, we have to check the large counts condition because we have to make sure we can trust or we can find the uh, appropriate critical value. More on that to come. And then finally, we have to check the 10% um, condition because we have to make sure we can trust the standard deviation of the statistic. So all of these are gonna to have to be conditions that we check for a confidence interval, just like we did for a sampling distribution. And once we know they're all met, then we can actually calculate 
our interval. So let's use what we have and actually calculate this interval so we can try and estimate the proportion that Ms. Marbero is looking for. So just using my calculator, I punched it in. I got a margin of error is 0 0.098. And once I've added margin of error to the point estimate and subtracted it from the point estimate, then I got my actual confidence interval. So this was based on a 95% confidence level. So we'd say that Ms. Barbero is 95% confident that the true proportion of students in her district who think Lord of the Rings trilogy is better than the Star Wars trilogy is somewhere between 42.2% and 61.8%. So that was a quick overall of how to do the confidence interval. Now I wanna do some specific examples that align with the objectives that we're learning um, in this video.